Okay. All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining um, this evening's craft research talk, The Pointers, A Legacy of Black Chairmakers. I'm Melanie Goodman, Grant Program Manager of Research and Ideas for the Center for Craft, a national nonprofit that increases access to craft by empowering and resourcing artists, organizations, and communities through our grants, fellowships, and programs that bring people together. We believe that craft matters. This evening's program is presented in partnership with Berea College Student Craft and Berea College's Carter G. Woodson Center for Interracial Education. Um, and so, as you might be able to tell, our program includes both a live and virtual audience. Um, I'm moderating from the Center for Craft in Asheville, North Carolina, and our program speakers, Charlie Rylan and Robel Awaka, um, are joining us from Broria College with our live audience um, because they are currently in residency working with the students of the Student Craft Program to build ladder back chairs inspired by the Porner family. So, I'll be passing the mic to Charlie and Bell in just a moment. Um, but since 2005, the center has annually funded researchers, scholars, artists, curators, and organizations in support of scholarly craft research in the United States through the Craft Research Fund. In 2022, Rebel and Charlie received a Craft Research Fund Artist Fellowship to support their research into ladderback chairs created by the Pointers, a multi-generational family of free and enslaved craftspeople working in Central Tennessee between the early 19th and early 20th centuries. So in conjunction, in conjunction with today's program, um, Charlie and Rebel's research is presented in the exhibition Hammer and Hope at the Center for Crafts Gallery in downtown Asheville. The objects included in Hammer and Hope explore, reinterpret, and reimagine what the field of furniture making today would have looked like had histories and legacies like the Pointers and countless others that have been subject to similar patterns of erasure uh, been celebrated rather than hidden. Um, and so we'll end out today's um, program with an audience Q&A, and it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to Robel and Charlie. Thank you, Melanie. Um, yeah. I'll start it off. I'm Robel Aweka, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a chair maker, and, um, <laughs> and a researcher now, and, <laughs> and I do some writing as well. So, um, yeah, so this project, um, you know, Charlie and I were exploring uh, the Pointer family and their legacy and their chairs. Um, so that kind of fueled uh, the chairs that we made for the exhibit that's currently on view at the Center for Craft, Hammer and Hope. Uh, and this is one of those chairs that's in the exhibit. Um, and all of the slides will be um, a few of the chairs that I made and Charlie made for, for the exhibition. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a chair that was inspired not only by the Pointer form, so the overall form of the chair, um, we took measurements when we were doing research um, in Tennessee of different pointer chairs, and uh, we based kind of the overall form and structure of the chair on the pointer form. Uh, but with the back slats, I, I added, um, was kind of inspired by the quilts of G's Bend, um, which is a craft tradition that, you know, I really, um, I really admire. Um, next slide, please. So here you can kind of see sort of the reference. Um, and it, it really spoke to me because I feel like in woodworking, since I've been woodworking for the past decade, um, you know, it was hard for me to find any information on black craftspeople, uh, particularly furniture makers. Um, and, you know, I didn't hear about the pointers until maybe three or four years ago. Um, largely through the work of the Black Craftspeople Digital Archive. Um, and, you know, I was already interested in chairs and part of, you know, my, what I'm referencing also in the back slats is a chair tradition from Ethiopia, uh, where my parents are from. And the carvings that go through the back slats uh, kind of mirror um, carvings that go through chairs in Ethiopia called Jimma chairs. And they're super sculptural, really beautiful chairs that are carved out of single logs. It just kind of blows the mind if you've been doing woodworking for a little bit. Um, how that's even possible is, is kind of, um, it's kind of crazy. So 
I wanted to combine that with black craft traditions in America to kind of add something new. Um, that, that kind of speaks to me as somebody that, you know, sort of feels like I'm straddling dual identities. Um, and I just kind of wanted to contribute something new, I guess, to, you know, the communal project of black art and culture. So fusing these craft traditions from Ethiopia, from America, um, really, f and the pointer form just kind of felt like something that I wanted to explore. And this was kind of one of the first iterations of that exploration um, for, for this exhibit. Um, one last thing I want to say about G's Bend is that's so phenomenal to me is just that, you know, this is, again, this is like another multi-generational story of craft artists that, you know, were making, just developing a sophisticated abstract visual language um, generations before, you know, Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, the New York School. And it's just, I mean, I think it's, it's stories like that that speak to me and kind of fuel my work and, and I wanna be in conversation and reference those stories, and that's really important to me. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So this is another chair that I made. Um, that's my shop in the background. <laughs> it's in my backyard. Uh, and um, yeah, so again, like it's the overall pointer form, and I really like to kind of riff with the back slats and try different things. Um, and, and also, too, I take my cues, my process cues, from black art and craft traditions. I feel like so much of woodworking is very um, pre-planned, premeditated. It's kind of like uh, implementing an idea and, and making the material kind of conform to your idea instead of working with the material and maybe adding room for improvisation, which is um, a, very, a very black modality in terms of art and aesthetic traditions, whether it be music like jazz and hip hop, you know, which, which I grew up on. Um, I wanted I wanted that openness, and I feel like that's kind of where the back slats and you know so much of the carvings happen kind of spontaneously as I'm carving, um, and that's important to me. I feel like the the process of that and feeling kind of like um, less bound by a sketch or a drawing is 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 really important to me in my work. Um, next slide, please. And you can see I was sort of referencing this. Um, the Door of No Return off the coast of Senegal in Gore Island, where um, a lot of enslaved Africans um, were um, departed from Africa across the Atlantic into a new identity as black people. Um, and the title of this chair is um, A Throne of No Return, A Chair for Us All. Um, next slide, please. So this is a chair I made for my daughter. <laughs> and again, this is kind of more of, you know, just kind of abstract, um, you know, I, I, those chairs in Ethiopia have geometric patterns that are very abstract, um, very idiosyncratic. I've never seen two that are alike. And I just kind of wanted to see how I could maybe um, explore my own visual language with shapes. Um, so, you know, this is just another iteration in that sort of realm of ideas. Next slide, please. Uh, these are bar stool commissions um, that, uh, and, and all of these kind of happened during the, the life of this project, doing this research. So um, this was a break from the pointer form. This is something a little bit different. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a close up of the carvings. Um, again, trying to, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's kind of it. So yeah, so I, I make chairs, I do research, um, and uh, yeah, I'll pass it to Charlie. Thank you very much, Ravel. Um And thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you all at Berea for hosting us here. Um, yeah, just to jump into it, uh, I work up in New Hampshire right now. Um, my dad had a cabinet shop when I was a kid, so this is something I've been on and off with for quite a while. Um, and Rebel and I have a lot in common when it comes to uh, this research project that we'll get into a little bit more. Um, but I come at this um, a little bit more from, from kind of a trades background. I was always interested in this as, as a bit more production, a bit more um, uh, li livelihood driven, essentially. And so I started essentially with 
pretty faithful copies of the pointer chairs themselves. Because again, these were chairs that were made uh, by folks who were literally forced to produce them at a pretty prolific rate. And it really drove a lot of the innovation there. And I find that to be um, something that's worth meditating on. Um, so these two are pretty near copies of one of the favorite chairs that Rebel and I were able to measure. Um, we made some slight modifications because it's also a chair that we teach. It's the one that students will be making uh, next week. Um, so we removed a slat, but everything else is pretty much um, the same. Uh, so this is the basic form. This is that iconic ladder back um, that we were looking into. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the pointer form, but one of the things that they did that I was really inspired by was that they were, uh, they were decorating these things at an incredible rate and with a style of essentially pinstriping that we just don't see nowadays. So it's again something that you look through craft magazines, especially in woodworking, and you see a lot of repetition, right? Uh, not a lot of new forms, not a lot of new ideas, not a lot of new materials or techniques, especially when you get into that production side. Um, so I was really interested in the ways that the pointers were able to um, just elevate this very basic style and their work itself, uh, even though it was cranked out on this rate that I will literally never be able to imagine or to reproduce. Um, so that was something I, I really took away from our time with those chairs um, and wanted to dive in and still want to dive into a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I was also really interested in seeing what this form could look like or trying to imagine what this form could look like if the design work and the innovation that the pointers were doing was able to continue for another 150 years. Uh, we'll get more into this, but the ladder back, despite being one of the most iconic pieces of furniture in all of American history, is just criminally underrated. Almost never talked about, almost never written about. And we're nowhere near the rate of production and innovation and generation that the pointers were scratching at. But if that continued for 150 years, I have no idea where we'd be. And that really gives me a lot of hope because it means that there is a place where regular working people can sit down and make a living, but also express creativity and start to think about new ideas and progress. Um, and that was incredibly inspiring to me. Uh, so, next slide, please. Armchairs are one of the realms where I don't see a lot of design work going on around me. Uh, usually, the idea is to just slap arms on a pre existing form uh, and call it a day. Um, and some of those chairs are gorgeous, and I love them, and I like to make them as well. But again, I can't help but wonder if this wasn't a little bit more of a tradition that we were able to focus on and to elevate and to accept for what it is um, and see just where that might lead us. Um, next slide, please. Just give a second to sit with this. Again, I came to this from rural Idaho where my dad had a cabinet shop. Uh, my mom ran a daycare center. My dad was a mechanic before that. Uh, and I went out to Boston to go to school after his business went under because we decided, well, if you're going to keep doing this, it's a, it's a dumb thing to do, to be honest. It's hard to make a living. But if you're going to, you got to be bigger or better. Um, and so I went to trade school at the North Bennett Street School and had an incredible time. And the entire time that I was there, a full two years, my friends and I would joke every day that we hated furniture. And the reason I came to find out a long, long time later was because all of the furniture that I made there was named after monarchs. It was Queen Anne, it was named after famous designers, named after, after, after castles in Europe, right? It was furniture that I or it was uncomfortable in whatever space it was in. We could never be in that same space for one reason or another. I've never seen any of those pieces back home in Idaho, right? That just continued. I continued to make a living out of this just trying to figure out what to do next. And eventually I start to meet a few people that have similar ideas, Rebel being the main influence of all of those people. And we get to talking over the years and he sends me this article by a historian, James Newton, right? And we're in a, heel, a field that's entirely based on historical reproduction, historical innovation. What does this article say? It tells us that back around the time of the Civil War, 80% of the skilled craftspeople in America were black. But when I look at the field around me, all these pictures behind that quote, they come from the leading trade publication in our field. 40 years of publication, there has never been a pair of hands that don't look exactly like mine on any cover. 
So how is it that I work in a field based on history, historical reproduction, craft, identity, right? Woodworking is one of those core narrative elements that we have as a culture of craft. Mm -hmm. And we've erased 80% of that entire picture. What are we filling that with and why? And that really kind of speaks to the uh, intersection of Rebel and I's experience, right? That both from a class and a race perspective, most of the work that built the artwork, the craft work, the infrastructure around us that we all deal with on a daily basis is gone and replaced with what? Um, so yeah, it was really the genesis of a lot of conversation for us um, and a really great friendship. Yeah, totally, that's beautifully put. Yeah, I think what, what gets filled in that place is myth-making, you know, and, and I think that's so central to decorative arts. You know, I feel like you talk about this a lot, like it's a, it's a curated history, um, as it should be, but I think what's being chosen to represent America and American culture is far from accurate um, in terms of not only the majority of the types of objects that people were interacting with. Um, you know, you you walk into, it was my first time honestly at a, at a decorative arts museum like the MESDA, the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. And um, like Charlie was saying, all the furniture is just like Queen Anne and you know, Chippendale, neoclassical, empire style, all yeah, that. Sure. And, and I think it's like, that's the furniture of like the wealthy 0.01%. Um, so, you know, why are we choosing to have that represent American culture? Um, and then on top of that, like, even given that quote about the 80% um, being black people who were doing a lot of this skilled work, um, all the credit is going to the shop owner, you know? And I think what's so particularly, like I remember seeing a Robert Walker piece who was like a really uh, well-known uh, Charleston furniture maker, 18th century. And um, they had a huge cabinet that said Robert Walker, the dates that he was alive. And in 2017, there was a Robert Walker piece that was discovered at auction that had a signature inside it. And it was signed by and dated you know, 1805, I think, Boston. Um, and through looking at census records, people were able to find that Boston was, in fact, a free person of color working at Robert Walker's shop at the time. Um, and before that, he was an enslaved cabinet maker. So he was claiming authorship. Um, and, you know, I think um, even, even knowing that, like, Robert Walker enslaved people that were making his furniture that's not acknowledged in these museums. So, you know, what, it, what is, it's, it's just creating this myth that this lone um, person was doing all this work when they weren't, um, so yeah. Um, I think we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Yep, so, um, so again, so that kind of shared kind of question, frustration with the field is, is really what was the genesis of the research project that we proposed to the Center of Craft. We were hoping to look and dig into the uh, work of black and enslaved craftspeople to see if there weren't other traditions that we could essentially rekindle and start anew from, right? So we could bridge a gap that has gone on for 100 years um, and change the direction we are taking. So this is, is one of the original pointer chairs that we were able to measure. We traveled down to central Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee, where uh, Richard Pointer was enslaved um, and cranked out a remarkable number of chairs. Um, and really the thing to note here, uh, a couple different things, but this is, this is fairly iconic to the ladder back style. And again, it's probably something that anyone who spent any time in the South, but really any time in America has encountered. Uh, but it's kind of so common that it's really overlooked, right? Like I worked before I started making ladder, cha uh, ladder back chairs as a Windsor chair maker. Right? It's the same basic style or technique of chair making, starting with green lumber from a, a freshly felled log, working with hand tools uh, for efficiency and strength safe, uh, but based on a literal pattern that was named after a castle. Right? And it was not a chair that was owned by the vast majority of us because, well, it's expensive, it's hard to transport. Records show actually there was at least as much, if not more, uh, 
export of those shares out of the country back to Europe or from Europe to richer hubs like Boston or Charleston than there was transport of those shares, say, to the interior, especially as we moved west throughout uh, our time expanding in this country. Um, and so it's really, it's really something that's completely... Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, something that's overlooked. Um, but again, uh, when we do look and talk about it finally, right, this, you know, fast forward to about the 1970s, the first time this chair really starts to enter American conversation again comes back with the return to the back to the land movement, right? So literally in the 1970s, uh, a bunch of white folks are moving out to the country, buying up a lot of land and figuring out how to get back to a lot of the handcrafts. Um, and in that time, the ladder back chair was held up as kind of a counterpoint to some of that fancy furniture. But the story was never looked into again. And the history was kind of erased. Uh, and so a lot of the innovations that came from the Pointer family went unacknowledged. Um, next slide, please. So some of the details that make these Pointer chairs particularly exquisite in our eyes um, and are really kind of representative of their work, um, first and foremost, this weave, right? So they were weaving seats out of split uh, white oak material. And I have never in all my years seen something quite so tight and so fine as that. Usually when people are weaving, they're full, pulling splints, um, again, in the more modern tradition off of hickory bark, possibly out of white oak still, oftentimes out of a cotton tape or webbing known as shaker tape often. Um, and it's much thicker. It's much coarser. It's 5 eighths inch to an inch thick. The pointers were using material that they are hand splitting and scraping that's about a quarter inch wide. Um, and they are doing it remarkably quickly. There are basically word of mouth stories in Franklin, Tennessee, where they're from, of them just sitting down on a porch at any one of their clients and whipping out a new seat on a chair in no time whatsoever. Um, we also have this kind of painted detail on my left uh, yeah, your left as well, right? Um, that was pretty iconic for a lot of their work. Same to the right side, this really fine decorative painting. Um, and actually, it's pretty impressive because it really represents the kind of intergenerational nature of the business. So Richard Pointer was the father starting around, he was born in 1802, um, but making chairs as early as the 18 teens when he moved to Tennessee. Um, but we have Records, again, most of the oral records are actually of his son who is weaving the seats and his grandson who is doing a lot of this decorative painting. Um, a lot of his family, again, due to the ridiculous system of enslavement, was sent off uh, throughout various points of his life. But he was able, through this work, to keep his son and his grandson close by and working alongside with him, carrying on that tradition. The last little point that I'll uh, point out right here is on that leftmost chair with the yellow detail, um, you can see <clears throat> it's a little difficult, but there's a little scoop right above the seat on what is the rear post there. That little relief cut is what makes this a mule ear chair, which is, again, the most common uh, variation of the ladder back chair. Before that, they were turned usually, so they were straight-backed posts that mimic chairs that go back to the 14 and 1500s in Europe, and they are pretty darn uncomfortable. Um, at a certain point, though, someone thought it would be a good idea to relieve a little bit of that material and put a slight bend on it so it was a little more ergonomic. And that has just become a part of rote history, kind of lost the origin of that, lost to time. Um, but again, when we talk about it, it's usually referenced as an innovation within the Windsor chairmaking world, stemming from somewhere in Europe or in one of the major uh, centers of production, like Charleston or Boston or anywhere in Europe. The reality is, however, the Pointer family was making chairs at exactly the same time with those exact details. So we can't say where it is that those design elements came from, but it is a little ridiculous that we don't ever even stop to ask whether or not the people that were producing more chairs than God himself might have been the ones who were first to think about this. Instead, again, it's someone like Robert Walker, Charles Haywood, somebody who wrote a book, somebody who owned a shop, or more likely a shipping company that gets credited with design elements, and not somebody who has made tens and hundreds of thousands of chairs in their lifetime, probably. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, too, that um, in this time period, that style of chair, the muleared ladder back, was simply called a pointer chair in this region. Um, and you'll see at the end, we have an advertisement that Richard Pointer took out um, in the local paper um, claiming authorship. 
uh, for the chairs, which is pretty significant because at the time in 1849, he was still enslaved. So that's kind of a big deal to even, you know, claim this publicly. You know, you're not, that's, it's got to be real. Um, so here is just kind of showing the range also, too, of the different types of chairs that the pointers were making. You know, you see a, a high chair there, like a toddler's chair below, um, a big rocker um, to the right. And, you know, kind of key to their success was just the, the volume of production. And so much of that production was because of really just like innovations, you know, they, the only known um, horsepowered lathe, so the, a lathe is basically a type of machine that helps you turn wooden parts around. Um, and it's used a lot in chair making. And so he's making chairs in the early 1800s. So this is like pre-industrial furniture making, no, no real machines. Um, but what he did was he rigged up a system to where his horses could power um, kind of an apparatus that would spin the wood for him. And then he could take a chisel to it and round the parts quickly and kind of mass produce parts. Um, so there's no other known evidence of any other chair maker having that kind of machine. And we do know that he shared this technology with other chair makers in the area. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, just again, I mean, a, a few more shots of, of the kind of diversity of the chairs. The one on the left is the one that we loved so much that we've kind of worked to reproduce um, for this class and in some of our work here. Um, but yeah, also in the last slide, the one on the far right, the little rocker, uh, it's hard to see in that scale, but um, it was one of the biggest chairs I've ever seen, like a normal chair. And it's because it was for uh, the owner of that plantation. Most of these chairs that we had to go see were on a plantation, which was mm -hmm. my first time on my a plantation. My first time as well. It, it, was a, <laughs> it was a wild experience, but it was yeah. also really wild again to realize that, right, these chairs were known colloquially as pointer chairs. They weren't ladder backs. They were known by this family name. Um, and they were everywhere. everywhere. They are a dime a dozen at this point because we could walk into these houses and we could find just tons of them sitting around, going to rot, being used for whatever purpose still to this day, which if you think about it means they're like 200 years old almost and still just trucking along like there's nothing. Um, but yeah, so these, these guys were doing literally everything they could to make chairs to please everybody. And it just shows you just how much it forced them to work through design ideas so rapidly and really push this whole form, this whole style forward, make it something that unlike today, was part of high society, was mm -hmm. literally for entertaining, for bringing foreign dignitaries over. Um, and that's just something that's been entirely lost and is, is, is interesting to think about. Again, goes back to some of the work of imagining what would have happened if in 150 years we'd allowed that to be representative of American furniture. Where would we be? What would be the things that we surround ourselves with? Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the brief sampling of the Pointer story right now. Um, we'll move on to the last slide we have. I'll let LaBelle talk to you a little bit about that. Yeah, so here's that ad, uh, and it has a date right there at the bottom, September 21st, 1849. Um, and he is saying that he is the original maker of the celebrated pointer chairs. Um, and he's kind of stating that he's on his own book or he's being allowed to make money for the first time. Um, and it's pretty remarkable for me. I think when I first read this ad, I was just, um, because like Charlie was saying, like this, this particular style of ladder back, the Mueller ladder back, is just what we think of as a ladder back, um, as like a modern ladder back. And it gets taught as so many other names, Jenny Alexander chair, maybe even a Boggs chair, kind of has a similar sort of aesthetic, um, none of which is pointer. And he's still, to me, this is like screaming authorship, even to this day, you know, particularly as a black chair maker, this is just like, you know, this is something that I wish was more accessible. I wish this was something that, you know, when I was starting out 10 years ago, it was a story I didn't have to like, you know, try and get a, a research grant to uncover, to inspire my work. Um, so, yeah, so I think that it's just uh, indicative of like how much, is yet to be done, I think, in telling the story of skilled black crafts 
people in early America and how central they were to the built environment as well as material culture. Um, so, yeah. I think that's, that's the basic that's rundown that. we have of the pointer. We, we were hoping to invite Aaron up here to, to yeah. kind of have a little bit more of a, of a conversation about how this relates to Berea and the history here and, and, uh, and all of this work. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you very much for inviting me up. Yeah, thanks for, thanks, being here. Thanks for having us. It's amazing Appreciate to have it. you here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe folks here know a lot about Berea. We are a, a gathering of Bereans sitting here, but for some of you that are out on the live stream, it might be helpful um, to set the scene of why we at Berea felt it was so important to bring Charlie and Robel here. Um, Berea College, just in a little bit of a background, was founded in 1855 by an abolitionist minister with the goal of providing an interracial and coeducational education here in the southern United States. And Berea College was the first institution of higher education to accomplish this in 1855. And I think you have to understand that this is prior to the Civil War in Kentucky, a slaveholding state. It is, was that radical vision that allowed Berea College to graduate Carter G. Woodson in 1903. Um, so Berea is a, the birthplace of such an amazing legacy of integrated education that really aligns with the work that Charlie and Robel have been doing so well to amplify the voices and provide support for voices that have so often been left out of the conversation. A further wrinkle in that story is that tragically Berea College started to drift toward, drift toward seg segregation in the late 1890s and was forced to segregate with some legislation that was passed here in Kentucky in 1904. Prior to 1893, just over 50% of the students here at Berea College were students of color and just under 50% were white students. And that was very intentional. That was Fee's vision and Fee's mission to model a community and a society that could help move the whole country forward. That mission was derailed by something called the Day Law. Berea fought the Day Law all the way to the Federal Supreme Court, losing its final appeal in 1908. And Berea was a segregated all-white institution from 1908 until 1950. That's a tragic part of our history. It's a part of our history that, frankly, I think we're still trying to recover from, despite 74 years of amazingly intense work that's gone on since 1950. All of this, I think, is super important, and I'll try not to talk too much longer, because this period of segregation, this drift away from the founding mission of Berea College, is where Berea's college, where, when and where Berea College's craft program was born. Berea College's student craft program was started in 1893, and we immediately set about producing a line of objects, the material culture that you are referencing, that celebrated the white Anglo-Saxon settlers of Appalachia at the expense of all of the other stories that need to be included from that region. So our craft program grew to great national prominence in those first 50 years of its existence, but it did so leaving out an amazing number of contributors to the story of craft. And so when I learned about Robel and Charlie's research and their work, it just seemed like such an amazing fit for Berea College and for the work that we're doing here. Um, so forgive me for that long introduction, but I think it, it's important great. to set the scene. It's very important. Um, we've had some amazing conversations over the last few days, and Robel, we've had some amazing conversations on the mm -hmm. phone over the last several years. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if I could ask you, you've touched on this a little bit, but if you could flesh out for the audience here a little bit more what you imagine the world might look like if instead of celebrating the Windsor chair form and where it comes from and the messages attached to that, if we had chosen to celebrate the pointer chair. And mm -hmm. what could that mean, not just for a chair maker, which is a very significant thing, um, mm -hmm. but for the larger culture? Mm -hmm. Great question. I'll, I'll yeah. say it. This is, this is a personal one for me, because again, uh, this is where my background is. Um, right? I always think a lot about craft as essentially a microcosm of labor, right? We are somehow elevated labor. We are the exemplars of labor. We are still the people who are making the things that are a part of our everyday life, 
but somehow we're supposed to be a little bit closer to the artiste than we are to the factory worker. And that's an interesting choice, right? And it's reflected in the way that craft labor is expected to perform, right? So what types of objects count as craft labor? What types of objects are just trade labor, are factory or rote labor? Like, oh, you make a can, that's not craft, that's just labor. But you make a chair, that might be craft. That might be exciting. Oh, but it's a ladder back chair. It's not as cool. Oh, it's a Windsor chair. Suddenly you are craft. You are an artist, right? And all of those are parts of the conscious and ongoing conversation we have with ourselves um, to curate our history, right? We've made a lot of stuff because we have to in order to live. Um, and the difference between stuff and craft is just the things that we decide to choose as representative of who we are as a society, as a people, and as a history, right? So all of that to say is I think that those little objects that we choose to enshrine or to elevate, and those little objects that we choose to push down are really representative of the parts of ourselves individually and as a society that we also try and elevate and those that we try and push down. And when we choose things like the Windsor chair, we're doing two things. First of all, we are saying, nah, these are the people that are important, the 1% who can afford this, and not those people who uh, stop what they're doing when winter comes around because you can't farm in the winter and they make some ladder back chairs instead to make ends meet or to keep themselves off the ground. Um, and also on, on top of that, um, you're basically just saying that Oh man, I lost my train of thought right there. But that's 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 the, the gist of what I'm yeah. I'm thinking about. Right now. We're we're identifying these narratives of what makes us right, better, good, um, and we're throwing away the the parts of our life that we don't like as much. So I think choosing that Windsor really decides that the vast majority of us we're just not important. And the work that we do isn't important, mm -hmm. um, and it's not worth talking about or considering. Yeah, yeah, and I think particularly like the ladder back chair, like you know. You know, as you always say, like craft and, and decorative arts is, it is a curated history, it should be. But I think the ladder back chair just represents what America feels, it feels more authentic to America because here is, you know, a chair that really does symbolize sort of a more humble sort of working class um, object. You know, uh, originally a lot of farmers in the off season in the winter months were making these chairs, really defined by sort of like a, sort of rugged utilitarian aesthetic. And then you also have this story of the pointers who innovated the form and really took the style and, and did something different with it. Um, so that's also contributing, you know, uh, just another narrative of just like black innovation and craft. And I think those those stories, it, it's so, it, they intersect and I think it's such a great symbol too, you know, and, and I'm drawn to chairs too, because it, to me, it symbolizes rest and like community. And I think like it's a powerful object in that way. It also is interacted with like no other piece of furniture, you know, and the patina that it takes on from, you know, the hands and your oils on, on the armrests and things like that. It really has, it, it embodies kind of like a human presence that I feel like no other furniture object does. So it seems like it, it's so perfect to, to kind of symbolize like um, a history that we should be uplifting, not the history of the 0.01% who had, you know, ornate um, Chippendale chairs. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Um, yeah, really, and I don't want to just keep beating the same point, but it, it, I think that we, we live in a world where, unfortunately, a certain uh, architectural style, a certain style of furniture, a certain manner of dress can become uh, equated with what is formal, with what is fine, with what is professional, with what is successful. And, and I'm thankful to all of you for shining this light on not only the makers who made this furniture, but the styles themselves that could have been made not only by the Pointer family, but were made by families who are east of here living in the mountains, um, many contributors to this field who are forgotten and left out. Um, so. I guess where I'm, I'm going to nudge you a little bit more to just try to imagine, if you will, if you feel comfortable, mm -hmm. like, what do you think the, what, I guess where I'm going with this is what we have as craftspeople, yeah. the, the ability to control is the material objects that they surround themselves with. And if we are intentional with that, what, 
what dif- in some ways, what difference does that make? Or what can we dream of as craftspeople accomplishing by mm-hmm. making these objects that are intentionally more inclusive and stretch mm-hmm. that narrative? Yeah. Yeah, good question. I mean, I think like, I feel like another component I think about too is that like craft, also like, you know, craft objects made by people is becoming increasingly less accessible to everyday people because of capitalism, because of mass production. You know, we've got it, you know, being a craftsperson is like in in the 21st century is probably harder than it's ever been and it's just gonna get increasingly harder. Thus, like the objects we're making is gonna get increasingly more expensive. Um, I we We wrestle with that reality all the time, you know, and I think that um, it's hard as a craftsperson. I don't, I don't know that many people that can just make the thing. You know, it's you know you teach, you do have another job, you do things like that, and it's really just kind of like a passion um, that you're pursuing. So, I think, um, yeah, I think craft is it's it's powerful. I mean, I think it it you know it embodies culture, it it tells stories, and you know I I feel like um, yeah, I mean. All right. I uh, on further reflection, you're pro- I appreciate the prodding. I I, I I think sometimes of these objects that are a little like quote unquote simpler, right? They're less high style. They're less formal. They're less fancy, for lack of a better term. Um, less less adorned or ornate. Um, I think of them paradoxically as is is really a site for critical thought, um, right? When you're reproducing styles based on what some sort of catalog or trend or or school has told you about, that's what you're thinking about. You're thinking about executing something flawlessly to somebody else's standards, to somebody else's ordeals, to somebody or ideals or somebody else's values. Um, when you start working on things on a from a different lens, whether it's to make a living or literally to support yourself physically, right, building your own house, making your own food, whatever it might be, it's a different thought process that you have. Um, and so I think that taking a little bit of control over the types of objects that are representative of our culture gives us a new site for that critical engagement, right? A a kind of parallel track that I'll give you as an example. Um, at most of the major changes in, in our country's history, we've had to kind of reinvent our history, right? So you think about things around the industrial revolution, you think about Henry Ford and the development of the factory system, right? That was rough. Right, a lot of the traditions that we had, our own timetables, our own traditions, our own, oh, um, our own, uh, our own ideas of how we run our lives had to be upended because they didn't fit in that schedule. They didn't fit in that kind of compartmentalized workday life, um, and that was hard to do. So people like Henry Ford had to come up with ways to make us feel a little better about it or forget all that we were losing, right? So they have to literally create living history museums that tell a kind of curated story about where we came from and show how much better our life had gotten since we introduced that factory system, right? So that's us kind of accepting those ideas, those narratives, and trying to say that like, well, I need to conform. I need to put myself in this box. I need to be there when that whistle blows and I need to leave whenever that whistle blows again and get enough sleep, stay sober enough, whatever it is, to be able to rinse and repeat day in and day out, right? And that's oftentimes what comes in one form or another when you're focusing on those objects, values that are handed to you from elsewhere, right? But to take a step back and to simplify a little bit and think about where we came from, what we actually need, how we can get to those places, it opens up opens up a little bit of space for us. It's it's room for new thought and new conversation. So it's a way for us to simplify and to decide where we want to go, right? So I can't answer your question in that I don't know where we'd be if we were free to think about it all, but I do know two things. If we did focus on things like the ladder back, we'd have a little bit more time. I also know that, like Rebel said, the people making some of this quote-unquote high-style empire furniture were few and far between and looked really similar. Right? The people making ladder backs were all of us and hundreds and thousands of us. So again, I don't know where we'd be if we stuck with that, but I know there'd be a lot more of us. And I know that with a lot more brains, we'd have had a lot more good ideas. And I have a lot of faith that we would be in a much better place. Maybe overstating it, but it's genuinely what I think about when I sit down at a shave horse for a day and just do manual labor. Um, so I think there's a lot of power in that. Mm. Mm. Oh, God. 
Yeah, I mean, I can't, I think a lot of what you presented to us tonight has been so powerful, but I can't stop thinking about the slide that shows all those white hands and the graphic that teaches us, that tells us that 80% of those hands 100 years ago, 150 years ago, were black hands. And I think as someone who is a furniture maker who derived a lot of joy and a lot of um, pleasure from being a furniture maker over the years, um, I know that I learned a story that was whitewashed. And I didn't know I was learning a whitewashed story when I started because the magazines that I respected, the books that I respected and I read from, when I looked at the pictures, I saw, sadly, someone who looks a lot more like me than like you, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much loss that happens there, right? It, it, it's just such a tough thing. So I just applaud you both for opening our eyes to this, for, for magnifying that story and shining a light on that. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, we'll start. So Cleo asked a very good question about the origin of the Pointer family name. Where did that name come from? Um, and it, have you unearthed any evidence of that? Yeah. Was it the name of the plantation? And also another great question. Um, about where this source material was gathered. Who mm -hmm. were the people that you learned this information from? Who were you able to speak with and how were you able to gather that information? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And thank yep. you. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of um, the information was from sourced from the Williamson County Archives, um, which is where Franklin, Tennessee is in, where the pointers were operating. Um, it wasn't coming from any of the plantations where we saw um, a lot of the pointer chairs. And particularly, one local historian, Rick Warwick, um, is kind of seminal in really um, <clears throat> documenting and trying to record and, and collect. He's a, he was a big collector of pointer chairs, um, the story of the pointers. So uh, we visited with him when we were in Williamson County. Um, and he was a great, I mean, he's since the 70s. Um, he's been documenting, collecting pointer chairs, documenting oral histories. Uh, from descendants. He got a historical marker on the site of their uh, home and factory. Um, so he was really, um, he was just a wealth of information for us. Um, yeah. And yeah, uh, the, the discovery of the pointer chairs came actually from kind of, he was a history teacher at the local school mm -hmm. system and he would routinely do a project where he would have students bring like something kind of un unremarkable or every day from their home life and somebody brought in this chair and basi basically one thing led to another they discovered that it was something that was everywhere and then the area is kind of traditional or you know ha has a, a, a a bunch of people who have been there for a really long time, families that are long standing, and so they just remembered all this. So there was a lot of just oral history that was like, oh yeah, we knew the pointers, or like my grandfather would tell me stories about this or that. Um, so yeah, it's just a lot of local knowledge. Yeah, and uh, so Richard Pointer uh, moved to Williamson County with his enslaver, Robert Pointer, um, who Rick Warwick has told us through oral accounts was most likely his father as well. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think it's it's such a it's an interesting story. It's a, it's a very a, a sadly American story, um, but that ad that he took out in 1849 is pretty significant because one year prior, um, his enslaver passed away, and he was inherited uh, by his most likely half brother, A. B. Pointer. Um, so maybe that accounts for why he was for the first time allowed to make his own money and take out that ad, um, you know, so, um, yeah. And, like, did you talk to any of the descendants, or are they, like, kind of inaccessible? No, we haven't. We haven't talked to any, and, and we're, I think our next thing is, uh, so he, Richard Pointer moved from Halifax, Virginia, um, so we have plans to kind of, like, check in with the archives there to see if, um, you know, we, we want to know if there's documentation of his mother and, um, if there's like another side of the Pointer family that maybe we can get in touch with, but um, yeah. We're also very interested in, in seeing if we can find any more of kind of the 
lineage of his craft education. Um, because it's, it's pretty much written off as like, well, his enslaver taught him, and that's based entirely on records of what was on the plantation whenever he passed away, which uh, doesn't feel very indicative, because again, right, it's a plantation. He also had like stuff to grow tobacco, but it seems very unlikely to me that he was out there growing tobacco. Yeah. He had cobbler's um, equipment, stuff to make shoes, a loom. Right. Um, so it's just, a, it's just an assumption that I feel like plagues a lot of um, research into enslaved craftspeople and you know I think there's just an assumption because of all of this myth making that we've been talking about I think when you when you erase histories and I think black erasure is kind of built into our system and it bolsters and supports white supremacy and I think you know it's so hard for us to do this research because there isn't the documentation for a reason you know and I think that um, what gets filled in when things are erased is, are those myths. And I think a lot of people who, you know, early folks doing this research, um, you know, have their assumptions that just aren't really based in anything factual, like, you know, he was taught this by his enslaver. And um, so, yeah, so I think that's some of the difficulties in, in doing this work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Melanie, any questions? Yeah. Yes, we do have a question from um, one of our audience, virtual audience members um, from Anna. They've asked, uh, so for both you and Charlie, uh, what other less, lesser known historical, historical or contemporary crafts, people, or styles are you inspired or influenced by? Yeah, um, a lot. I mean, uh, Harriet Powers, uh, she was a quilt maker outside of Athens, Georgia. Uh, she was working in the late 19th century. She had these really beautiful pictorial quilts. Um, and they were a mixture of biblical stories that were significant to her, her and her community at the time, as well as natural phenomenon. So, you know, they're just like so, they're striking the way she renders animals and um, those images. They're kind of reminiscent of like Dahomey lineage uh, tapestries from West Africa, and, um, but they're like her own style. And there's this one particular square in the center of one of her quilts, which is at, housed at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's the central square and it's like, it really captivated me. So I was looking through their um, digital catalog and it's this astrological event that happened in 1833. Uh, it's called the Leonid Meteor Shower and it happens every 33 years. And um, depending on where you are on Earth, you know, you may or may not see it. But in 1833, it happened in America. You could see it from everywhere. Um, and apparently, like, Frederick Douglass journaled about it and, you know, other, you know, it could be seen from all over the United States. But it was a very significant event to black communities at this time because it was seen as sort of a symbol. Um, and, and, it, and, it's, and that's supported by the fact that she included it in this quilt, um, which was a combination of kind of like biblical passages that with you know, kind of moral instruction as well as, um, it really was a documentation of oral tradition because this event happened in 1833, which was a few years before she was even born, so she didn't experience this event. Um, and it was such a, it became kind of a time, a way to mark time for a lot of uh, black communities uh, Stars Fell Over Alabama what is a song that's kind of based on the Leonid meteor shower of 1833. So people thought it was Judgment Day, black and white. They were just, they'd never seen anything like this. It's really a meteor storm, which means there was just like thousands of falling stars at one time. Um, and I think like I learned about that history from her quilt. I was never taught that history. I was never taught its significance to black communities and how it was kind of this like symbol that people were like, hey, you know, this is kind of, you know, maybe this is some sort of uh, omen saying that the end of enslavement is near, and it was such a significant event. So um, it, it's, it's crazy how I was taught that by Harriet Powers from her quilt, you know, and that, that's, really, uh, that's really powerful, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, Rebel is, <laughs> yeah, Rebel is, is good for this. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think I'll add one more tradition, uh, yard shows. Yard shows, I, I, I mean, it's, it's a kind of more of a Southern thing, but essentially it's um, assemblage art 
uh, outdoors uh, assemblage art uh, in the yards that you'll find in black communities. Um, some big yard show artists are people like um, um, Joe Minter and um, uh, Thornton Dial. And uh, so it's, it's basically like using found objects um, to create kind of public works of art, which has been happening in, in black communities for generations. Um, so uh, I, I really love that tradition. Um, yeah, that's a cool one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't really have individual names that tend to stick with me and, and push a lot of my work forward. As I've kind of mentioned in here, I'm, I'm pretty interested in the labor side of things. So a lot of my uh, kind of visual inspiration comes from areas where you see uh, traditional work and kind of artistic creativity intersect. So printmaking, illustration, sign painting is something that kind of mapped on and I saw a lot of in the pointer work. I really enjoy a lot of that. Um, and then most of it is, again, historical stories, a lot of labor history, um, kind of conversations or stories around where people came from, what they lived through, um, and the various different struggles that they went through to try and make our world better through their work. Um, so yeah. Tully asked a question um, of, of Robel and Charlie, what they could share about diversity in craft outside of the Southern United States, be it in the Northern United States, Western United States, or even abroad. And then Tully asked a question about the son and grandson of Richard Pointer, and if they had any information that they could share about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, um, craft traditions in the North, um, John Goff was a cabinet maker um, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia had like a very vibrant black community, uh, free black community, and um, there were multiple cabinet makers, but John Goff really stands out. Um, and yeah, I think most of, I, I live in the South, and I think so much of skilled um, craft was happening, or the, at least that black people were doing was in the South, um, whether enslaved or free people of color. Um, so that's where I tend to kind of like focus my research and like what I'm thinking about. I, yeah. So I live up in New England and have for quite a while. It's where I went to school. Um, and I'm from out west. My family's in Idaho. Um, and my experience, which is more anecdotal and less based on hard research there, is that it is still ridiculously male-dominated and ridiculously white. Um, out west, it feels like it's something that's a little more overlooked in general. It's just not something that's prioritized, especially where I grew up. There's just not a lot of money not a lot of people, it's not a way that you make a living, it's kind of silly, it's akin to being an artist, like, oh, you're just gonna go away and do that, fine. Um, and I, again, that's not really based on, on research per se, but I do know in what I research, and one of the reasons why I, I like thinking about the South is, right, Berea is a perfect example of it, you have a, a pretty unique history when it comes to, say, the settlement school movement, right, where there was an active, uh, attempt a campaign long standing by a lot of very wealthy people from weirdly the North, like the Rockefellers or whoever it might be, to create this kind of curated history around American culture um, and to use places like Appalachia, uh, at least a, a specifically newly divine, de defined version of that, to set the stage for this kind of like homespun authenticity, rugged individualism, and then to kind of push that out elsewhere. So my experience has been that, right, like from out west, coming from the west, craft is eastern, right? And there's this kind of divide, right? It's craft down south and it's art up north, or it's high style up north and it's, you know, this Appalachian homespun thing down south. Both fabrications and things that, uh, yeah, make me have a lot more questions than answers. But that's, that's been my experience. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question uh, super well. <laughs> Oh, and uh, the descendants, sorry, mm, fortunately, mm -hmm. um, after the Civil War, uh, Richard Pointer was freed, uh, as were his remaining children. We do not know. So he had many, many more children. It was only one son and grandson that were allowed to remain with him for that work. Um, so we don't know. It's really hard. We tried to track down. Um, track down records, but his family was also out in Texas. They seemed to be, the, sorry, the enslaver's family seemed to, to move kind of perpetually. Um, and so those, those descendants were kind of spread around. Um, and unfortunately, 
pretty shortly after the end of the Civil War and their freedom, um, they stopped making chairs. Um, and it's something we think about as to why that might have happened, but it just seems to be true. They go pretty abruptly from listed as chair makers on the census to just farmers. Um, and then they just kind of drop out of the record. Um, so that's all we really know right now. Okay, um, we do have a question um, from our virtual folks. Um, this is from Alexis. Um, they ask, uh, you mentioned some of the innovations that were needed to make at the prolific rate these chairs are made. Uh, were you able to recreate slash learn about those innovations? And if so, can you touch on them? Yeah, definitely did not make a horse-powered lathe. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, I think something that's central to both of our practices is like green woodworking, so, you know, which requires more hand tools than machines, and we really like working wood in that way, also what draws us to ladder backs. And I think too, like, um, you know, even just construction methods, we were e able to see a joint that was taken apart um, at Rick Warwick's office uh, from, a, you know, a chair that was broken, a pointer chair. and you know, we could see kind of like how he was constructing these things and how he was utilizing the property of green wood to his advantage. Um, so essentially what he was doing was, um, you know, and this is common to a lot of green chair making is, you know, using a greener or a, um, a more wet, newly felled material for the posts, for the back posts and the front posts. And then the rungs were made out of drier stock. So what would happen is when you assemble the chair, the drier rung will take on moisture from the wetter posts and it will kind of lock in and expand inside the joint. Um, so that way a lot of chair makers could avoid using uh, glue. And really the only glue that, that was available at the time was hide glue, animal hide glue. Um, so you know, using that sort of method is what how I make chairs, you know, and how in, you know, it's like, was you know informed by also how pointer make chairs so so we had we had a question asking would you ever make a horse lathe we have some horses here for your college yeah. I, you got a whole week next week I uh, <laughs> I I understand the impetus and it is it is interesting um, I would not. Um, <laughs> But for a, a pretty specific reason, it's like, right, the interesting thing about the horse-powered lathe is that it allowed them to work quickly and efficiently. At this day and age, we have electric lathes, which go more quickly, require less input, all of that sort of thing. And, and, and that's the part of the innovation that interests me the most, again, mm -hmm. is finding ways to make uh, actual living out of this practice. Um, and we were actually just having a conversation about this today in the shop. We kind of sadly nowadays feel like we're in this weird in-between where I would love nothing more than to be able to sit down and make you know, a set of 12 chairs every month and literally pay my bills on that. And it would allow me to sell those chairs for pretty low price points. But craft is in this weird spot where most collectors want one of two things. Well, it's, most people want one of two things, right? Like you're either like, you know, relatively wealthy and collecting things as essentially art pieces or handcrafted objects. And in that point, you're kind of in this weird game where admitted or not, uh, higher price somehow indicates higher quality. And so like if someone looked and was like, oh, a $400 chair, how good could it be? And they're gonna pass on it. Whereas if you're like me and you're like, hey, you wanna buy a chair for $400? I'm like, ooh, let me save up for that. I don't really have the funds. So like trying to fit in that middle ground that the pointers were in where they are literally cranking stuff out for use at that rate and at that price point is, um, it's kind of hard to imagine nowadays, and I, I think that's a shame, um, but I like to think about it a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it would be cool, but it, 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 uh, it's not my, not my type of work. So thank you for the question. <laughs> Melanie, do you have a question? Any questions on the chat? Yeah, um, okay, so we've got some questions rolling in. So um, this one, <laughs> this one is from um, Bo, and they say, uh, you're both so incredible. Thank you for the research that you've done and the incredible information you have shared today. Uh, my only question is, can I please take your class next week? I will just watch. <laughs> oh, I, I think I, I, 
may know that bow or through somebody reaching out asking if they could <laughs> take the class. Listen, I would be down, but it's, it's, a full, it's a very full class putting us on the spot. I don't know. What do we think? <laughs> All right. Blood gates are open. Oh man. What's one more? What's one more shave for? We can make another shave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can take that up with we'll the Pinecroft people. Right. That's that's we'll, for later. We're gonna time. huddle later, and then we'll 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 reach out. We'll reach out. Very good question from Charlie in the audience, asking if Charlie and Robel have any idea what a pointer chair would have cost in that time, and perhaps what that would equate mm -hmm. to in cost today. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, unclear, but we do know that people did pay in installments, which, you know, it's not meaning it wasn't cheap. Um, and then that's also something I think about too. I think that furniture was um, never, I think, as, as affordable as we expect it to be these days. I think people saved up for furniture. They, they took care of it. They fixed it when it was broken instead of chucking it and getting something um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, mass production. And I think, like, in talking about, like, oh, why couldn't the pointers and their descendants keep making chairs, I think it's a couple of things. They were in the South after the Civil War. Segregation was just, you know, um, brutal. And uh, there are lots of black people who were doing craft work just were out of work. Uh, were shut out of the economy. So there's that. And then there's also industrialization, which affected black and white alike. Um, and I think like that's it's still affecting us in the sense that like we have a warped perception, I think, of of value in terms of of what you know the value of things. Um, so uh, all I all I know from I think it was like some of it from his books was that people did pay in installments. Um, it, so the like records would have a range of prices, and I cannot adjust for inflation in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was like two to six dollars on average for a lot of those pieces. And again, the pointers were pretty interesting because they would do, um, as did most chair makers of the time, a really wide variety of options. So you could buy chairs that were pretty much unfinished. You could buy chairs mm -hmm. that were painted, whether just for like kind of a, a type of finish, right? Like a, a coating essentially to make sure they were a little more durable. You could buy ones that were um, that were fancy and they were literally written down as fancy chairs. And those are the ones that were embellished, whether it was with um, a decorative painting or something called graining, where they would mm -hmm. basically be like, well, we made this out of maple from the backyard, but we're gonna make it look like rosewood because that's what people in fancy places have. Um, so there was, and those are like pretty interesting. I don't know how accurate they are. The ones I see uh, always just look like very splotchy. Yeah. It's like black and then somebody like Jackson Pollock some like red and mauve on there. And I was like, I guess I can see where that came from. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's the best we can do for cost. Sorry. Okay, um, so this question is from Morgan. They say, uh, what messages might existing and potential makers take from what you're learning about the pointers and other makers maybe during their time? Mm. I think for me, like just the, the notion of him innovating and using what, I mean, I consider technology in the form of like that horsepower lathe has kind of freed me from maybe some sort of like romantic hangups about like true craft, you know what I mean? Or like, oh, it's got to be hand tools, everything, and like this, that, and the third. And it's like, I think for me, it's liberated me to say like, yeah, like, you know, they were trying to make a living. They were trying to, you know, um, do that. So I think I, I should be doing that too. And I should be incorporating, you know, ideas around production that feel right to me in my practice that also allow me to like do the parts of it that I love, which is the handwork. Um, so, you know, like that, that definite for me personally, like, you know, on a couple of chairs, I made a jig where I could use a router to kind of uh, mortise, to basically make the joinery where the back slats go into the back post because that's just something that's tedious and takes time. Um, so I was just kind of experimenting to see if that's something that like I can get out of the way so it can afford me more opportunity to kind of take my time with the back slats where I feel like I have more uh, freedom to like express and kind of explore things. So yeah, that just knowing that I was like, oh yeah, this, this makes sense. You know, I don't, you know, this, yeah, it freed me from that kind of romantic idea of like true craft or whatever, so. Yeah, I 
completely agree. I would just say that it's a great reminder to think a little more critically about what and how you make and why you do either of those two things. So totally fine to remake. I know I've been giving Windsor chairs a hard time, but if you grew up in New England, you probably saw a lot of those. And so if in this day and age, that's what you're used to and that's what you want to learn to make, very cool, but understand a little bit of why that was and where they came from. And the same as Rebel, like you just really need to stop and ask yourself what is valuable, like yeah. uh, machines versus hand tools. Like, I mean, it's a ridiculous question. Like, when does it become a machine? I mean, a lever is a machine, right? A ramp's a machine. Like, what are we talking about here? So, like, just take a breath and like and enjoy what you're doing and do it with purpose and uh, yeah, make a living out of it. That'd be mm -hmm. awesome. So we had a question about the quarter inch wide seat material that Charlie and, and Robel taught us about that the pointers used, um, asking had they seen examples of that in other places and from other makers? And then a question about if they had any knowledge about where they were sourcing that material. The, uh, our, our friend in the audience was bringing up just the rarity of oak, white oak at that quality that's available today, and if they had any ideas about where the pointers were gathering all of that mm -hmm. incredible material. Mm -hmm. So the, the sourcing question first, because it's probably the clearest and simplest. Um, again, working for a plantation owner who had upwards of 1,500 acres worth of land over there, um, and that included a, a pretty sizable wood lot, so most of it was just coming from their land. And I'm assuming that the quality of the material, similar to most of the other trees in America, right? Like there's a reason why old houses have wide pine planks for flooring, and we don't. Those things don't exist. Um, we cut stuff down for barrels when it comes to white oak or for ship masts. Um, so I, I'm guessing it was just a little bit more available, readily available in the land they did have. Uh, and in terms of the material that they were using in their specific weaving, no, we have not seen anything right. comparable. Like it really is like you walk into one of those things and one, you can still sit on them. They're just like wildly solid. And it's just, it's an interesting weaving pattern. I've not seen that particular, it like makes this little like W. It's not a full herring on bone. herringbone. Yeah. It's not a like traditional, tri like a diamond. I don't, I don't know. I had to ask, I have a good friend who's a basket weaver and I would be like sending her messages and being like, what is this? And she could tell me, but I'd never seen it like that. And then as to materials, one of the cool things about ladderbacks, um, right, again, it's a particularly Appalachian tradition, and Appalachia is kind of defined, at least in a lot of early like, accounts I've seen, by difficulty of traveling to different areas. And so things were like hyper-regional, and that definitely went for seating material. So these chairs were made out of a wide variety of material. The pointers in particular used maple for most of the parts, but a lot of people use ring porous hard hardwoods like oak or ash um, or hickory to make those things. And then seeding material was even more widely varied. So I have seen stuff made out of corn husk. I have seen mm. stuff made out of rush. I have seen stuff made out of rawhide. I have seen stuff made out of hickory bark. I have seen stuff made out of ash and oak splint. I have seen stuff out of cotton webbing. Um, mm -hmm. Literally like figure out where you're at, find out what poor people could get their hands on, and then that's what their chairs had for seats. And I, I was going to add about the corn husk. There's a multi-generational family of black chair makers in South Carolina, the Hunters, um, and they exclusively use corn husks for their uh, seat weavings. So. Mm -hmm. you, you found the nerd in us with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, so this question is from Katrina. Um, it's th they've said, um, this is amazing research. Uh, thank you for presenting uh, where you are uh, with it thus far. I'm wondering if you have learned about historical black female woodworkers. Mm. Good question. Uh, I have not. Yeah, the the record is is wildly thin. We were very lucky. I mean, honestly, we started this with a broader uh, scope, um, and then had an incredibly difficult time finding any place to start. And it was uh, lucky of us to encounter uh, some incredible people that have a project called the Blackcraft Digital Archive, mm -hmm. where they are intentionally trying to build a database of. Uh, this type of work and they put us on to this first story and it ended up being so generative that we still haven't really exhausted it. So um, again, unfortunately, no. And there is a, a lot more for us to find, hopefully. Yeah. And I think in terms of like a more broader like black craft history, 
for me, like also extremely inspired by um, the sweet, gra sweet grass baskets from um, the Low Country and the specifically the Gullah Geechee community, Mount Pleasant, um, and that's uh, an incredible tradition that is like really in in recent decades have morphed into its own art form, um, and I think a lot of a lot of Black female um, brilliance is in quilting for me, and in and also in um, um, uh, other textile work like dressmaking. You know, I'm thinking about Ann Lowe, you know, who was a third generation seamstress, who was one of the first like American, you know, high end fashion designers, first black woman to own a, a couture like um, custom dress shop on Madison Avenue in New York, designed Jackie O's dress, made it as well. Um, and yeah. Um, so I, I mean, like I draw inspiration from from um, various like craft traditions. I feel like I, you know, for me, it's like I'm not as interested in like uh, uh, personally for my work. I'm not as interested in like referencing period furniture at all, you know. Um, and I think for me, it's just like I I source from like a broader Black craft tradition, which incorporates um, a lot of Black women and men. And, um, yeah, and just trying to like say something new with it. So, one thing I would I'll add, just like because it popped into my head too, like I feel like also like I'm curious about like what new craft forms are like happening now, you know, and and just I feel like because it's it's almost like an antiquated idea of like what we're defining as craft, you know, it's got to be textiles or woodworking or ceramics or, you know, things like that. But I feel like human creativity knows no bounds, you know, and I think um, it expresses itself. And, you know, I think people are doing amazing things like, you know, with upcycling clothing and um, nail techs, like nail art is incredible, hair braiding, you know, so many things that I feel like I, I also draw inspiration from that I feel like art is craft 100%, like not hyperbole, is craft. And I think that, you know, for me, like, it's important to, um, to kind of look at those things, too, and, and, and they have a place in the craft world, at least the craft world I want to be a part of. So. Melanie, do you have another question in the chat? Um, well, actually, I have a question, if that's OK. <laughs> OK, because um, we yeah. don't have any more questions in the chat. OK, so I'll prompt <laughs> OK. Um, what impact do you hope integrating histories like the pointers um, into your practice as educators um, has an impact on your students and then thus um, the future of woodworking practices? Oh, uh, I guess to be completely honest, I'm like less interested specifically in the future of woodworking practices and more interested in like some of the things that we've touched on a little bit here and what Rebel was just getting at here, right? The story that we've been telling and, and the part of this research that we've been able to kind of personally relate to highlights the intersectionality of this story, essentially, right? We come at it from different backgrounds. We have different experiences of struggle within the field um, that are related to class issues, issues of race. Um, and as we were just saying, right, there's also a huge component of, of gender in there as well. There's this just wild amalgamation of people that are affected by the way that we tell these stories and define these fields. Um, so essentially, having these conversations, doing this research is, is, in my mind, hopefully a way of building and generating solidarity, right? We feel like we've just been, from the get-go, picking off the people, right? It's been, it's been a bunch of us, the most of us, that made everything that we needed for every part of everyday life. Um, and slowly over time, right, that's been whittled down to like, no, no, those people make this and these people make that. Um, and it keeps us siloed and it limits our creativity. That's the, the best you can say about it. And the worst you can say about it is it literally limits everything else we can do. Um, so the hope is starting to build a even broader kind of understanding of our shared history and where we all come from and how we all interact and hoping that that will then encourage and empower us to create much broader shared futures and shared imaginaries um, that'll take us to hopefully someplace better than I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, well put, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I, I know for me personally, like, you know, I, I've, 
yeah, I mean, I think these stories, uh, they need to be out there, you know, and I think I, I wish I would have had access to them earlier in my career. Um, and I know like now it's just an essential part of my work is, is the research. They fuse together in, in kind of a, a seamless way that they're inextricable now. And also to like reclaiming this style of chair as a pointer chair is like central to my chair making as well. Um, and, and trying to like uh, uplift that legacy in that family. We, we do also talk a lot uh, that, you know, it, on our like grandest days, we hope that stuff like this would be like a beacon. And it has been to some extent, right? It's not just us now who get to talk about this. There's like a lot of people that have very similar thoughts about this field and this world as us. And uh, they have questions and then they ask us about them and we don't know the vast majority of the answers, but then it's just one more person who's interested in talking about that instead of Chippendale chairs. Mm -hmm. And again, cool if you want to talk about Chippendale chairs, just all I've heard about for a really long time. And I'd really <laughs> like to have some different conversations. Yeah. So like just throwing up a flag and like y'all can come after us and we can have new conversations. No hate, no hate to the people who like making Chippendale chairs. Yes. Windsor chairs, it's all love. Keep, yeah. ma keep making your chairs. <laughs> We do have one more question in the audience for sure, Cleo. Yeah. So Cleo uh, spoke up from the audience here. Cleo is a black woodworker um, and is asking about other resources outside of uh, Dr. Tiffany Moman's work with the Black Craftspersons Digital Archive. Are there any other resources that Charlie or Robel could share that Cleo could look into to inform their work as they move forward? Yeah, I think there's a lot of like, <clears throat> I think like John Michael Vlash was a huge, um, you know, academic and scholar and writer on um, black craft traditions, as well as Robert Ferris Thompson um, has written a lot. James Newton, who we had the quote from. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of this stuff is behind paywalls, you know, on like JSTOR and other sites where you can access um, old, you know, um, academic journals and things like that. And I think like that's part of, you know, like this, I hope, this becomes more accessible, you know, and I hope that, um, yeah, that's my hope. I feel like that's both of our, you know, our goals in this is just like trying to, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think for me it's just like the more I, I kind of do this, then people are like, hey, check out, you know, this book or there's this exhibit at this museum and see if there's a catalog, and, you know. Um, unfortunately, it's that way. Hopefully it's not for long, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, we know. We're we're fans. We do. We know about Cleo Lewis. Yeah, we know. The world knows. <laughs> Melanie, back to you. Okay. Well, um, we are actually at time. Um, so thank you so much, Charlie, Robel, and Aaron, and the folks at Berea for working with me to put this program on. And also um, thank you to uh, the audience um, for you know attending uh, tonight's craft research talk. Um, Hammer and Hope, if you can make your way to Asheville, um, it'll be up at the Center for Craft um, through July 13th. And so I think we'll be dropping a link um, in our chat if you want to you know, if you can't make it to Asheville, but you want to learn about um, that exhibition, it's located on our website. Um, and then programs like the Craft Research uh, Fund rely on support from people like you all. Um, so if you're interested in supporting projects like uh, Rebel and Charlie's research, um, please get in touch with our development manager, Olivia Hito. Uh, we're going to drop her um, email in the chat. And if you're interested in learning more about the um, fellowship and um, grant opportunities that we offer at the Center for Craft, um, please visit our website for more information. Um, and that's about it. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, if I can, while I have you here, because I always have one more thing to say. Um, almost all of you in this room spend a big chunk of your week making things. And those of you who maybe a lot of you are students, you may not be buying a lot of things now. But what I would ask you to take away from this talk 
Um, Robel, when you were talking about the quilt that inspired you so much, the story of the stars, the Lee and shower, um, it unlocked a whole community for you. Mm -hmm. And it helped to teach you about your culture and about cultures that exist in this country that you may not have been so connected to. So my ask of all of you is when you go back to making tomorrow, many of you are involved right now in designing things, think about what you're designing. Think about what story you want to tell. Think about what you want to leave for someone like Robel to find in years to come and mm. what story you want them to uncover. Mm. And then when it comes time to buy things, and I know most of you are Bria College students, so you're not buying a lot. <laughs> um, think about where you spend that money, right? You're going to have a day where you're faced with a Chippendale chair on the left and a ladderback chair on the right. And it might not be chairs, but think about what you want to support with the dollars that you have to spend. Because that's all power that you have, and no one can take that away from you. But it's really easy to fall into a trap of letting someone else define for you what is art, what is fancy, what is high culture. And God, if I can ask one thing of you, it's like, don't fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Well said.